Hi everyone, welcome to Bob 2021 and thanks for joining my talk on guarding your I.O. boundaries. Now, as an IT consultant, I usually don't code in purely functional languages in my day-to-day -day work, but as a Haskell enthusiast, I'm constantly looking for ways to learn from Haskell and improve my day-to-day -day work in languages like Java, Scala, or recently TypeScript. This topic, guarding your I.O. boundaries, is one where languages with an expressive type system like Haskell excel, but we will see that there's still a lot to learn in the TypeScript world. Now, before we dive into that, let's have a look at what I actually mean with I.O. boundaries. Whenever there's untrusted data exchange between components or with external entities, we do have an I.O. boundary. That can be JSON APIs, that could be user input, that could be message buses, databases, etc. It applies both to both front-end and back-end applications, and it is even more prominent with modern microservice architectures where JSON APIs play a much more central role. There are several strategies for dealing with uh, untrusted input at I.O. boundaries. One rather easy strategy is user input validation, where you can validate right at the source, and you actually can expect the user to change data based on feedback. So in the end, when, when the, the data is actually submitted, you can expect to have, uh, or uh, you can already expect to have only correct looking data after validation. This is rather easy to handle, but unfortunately it's only limit, limited to interaction with a human. For interacting with another service, you have to, you have to settle for different uh, strategies. One strategy is validation, ad hoc validation. So we usually have a validation layer at the, at the very boundary, but then pass on the original data. And we may add some more validation where it's actually necessary. So at the point where the data is actually used. In the end, some uh, validations may be checked multiple times. Some fields may never be validated because we don't actually use them or need them. So this approach has rather high fault tolerance, but rather bad and late fault detection. Then there's another strategy called parsing. Uh, parsing means converting less structured data like JSON to more, to more structured data like a domain object. So we can validate all reasonable assumptions in one place and then pass on something that's, that encodes those uh, assumptions. So we encode the guarantees in the, types, uh, uh, in the types, like converting strings to enums, converting unstructured key value maps to structured objects, etc. Validation failures uh, are communicated very early on, and so we avoid partial processing and we detect faults rather quickly. The downside is that we have pretty low fault tolerance. Another strategy is code from contract or code uh, or contract as code. So the idea being, instead of catching failures, why not avoid them to begin with? So we use a common library or schema registry specifying the interface and then use the same uh, component on both sides of our communication. As long as both sides use the same version of this component, parsing failures are practically eliminated. On the other hand, this approach is rather inflexible. You need to maintain this shared component and releases uh, in, or changes in the, uh, in the shared component lead to releases of all affected components with every change. Also, this approach often comes with a language lock-in, so it results in a rather closed world. Over my career, I've dealt with several of the strategies so far. And to me, parsing uh, looked like the, uh, the preferred strategy for a long time, but I really couldn't put my finger on it why this is the case. So a few months ago, I stumbled over a blog post that kind of exactly explained my gut feeling. Uh, it's called Parse Don't Validate. It's by Alexis King. And I definitely recommend to read it, but let's uh, quickly go over the essentials here. 
Now, the question is, what is parsing? In a wider sense, a parser is something that adds structure or structural knowledge to the input data. So it adds semantics and types to a JSON syntax tree or syntax structure to a source code file, etc. The structural knowledge can be used by the consumer, like in the case of a, syntax, uh, of a source code file, the type checker can use the syntax tree structure. If we change the structure, a parser recognizes, all consumers immediately know and we can react to breaking changes. With static typing, this is just a compile time type error. Changes are, ca are caught early on before they actually can lead to problems in production. If you look at JSON parsing, you often have two parsers in a row, one that converts the string, the JSON string, into an abstract syntax tree, adding the JSON structure, and one that converts the JSON abstract syntax tree to a domain object, adding domain structure. The second step is the much, uh, much more important one. It's trivial to spot a JSON syntax error, and a JSON syntax parser can parse any kind of JSON document. But to convert a JSON syntax tree to, the, to a domain object, you need to write a new parser grammar for each domain structure. Now, let's compare this to validation. With validation, we, we don't add any structure, domain structure, or type structure to the input. So unless the validation fails, we just return what we got in. And when the data is passed on, the next client to receive it will not have any further information on whether the data is correct or not. So they will either have to trust you or have to add their own validations. And as we add more layers, each layer will add its own validation logic. Eventually, this leads to something called shotgun validation. Input vali validating code mixed with and spread across processing code. Um, and in the end, we hope without any systematic justification that one check or another will in the end catch all the bad cases. There are several inherent pitfalls, like forgetting checks. Uh, so a downstream consumer falsely assumes that a check has been done upstream, but it hasn't. Or redundant checks, like uh, a downstream consumer that mistrusts the upstream and performs a check again, even if it has been performed before. Then it can lead to inconsistencies due to partial processing. Um, so when a valid portion of your input is already processed, but then later some validation fails and we, we realize that we shouldn't have processed the correct part uh, after all, so we have to roll back a partial change. And in the end, this is rather fragile on the change. When a data model is changed, then all the validations need to be adapted, but there is no mechanism that notifies consumers or developers uh, of the required change. So you really, really have to be very, very careful without being alerted in some way. Of course, you can do all the checks up front, but there is no systematic way to ensure it. So it requires a lot of discipline and effort to actually keep all the, all the checks in one place. In the end, downstream consumers are responsible for their data quality, so there is a strong bias towards performing checks non-locally uh, and at the very place where, it's, uh, where data is actually used. Now, let's have a look again at JSON parsing. As I said before, the first step is rather easy. So in particular, we're interested in the second step, converting the abstract syntax tree to a domain structure. And as we want to save work, um, most tools uh, that do this uh, try to leverage the type system in some way to generate a gra grammar from types. So given a type declaration, we, uh, we want to have a parser that is guaranteed to produce only valid instances of this type. And most popular frameworks leverage compiler or runtime features to ensure that, so you don't have to write the same uh, type of boilerplate code over and over. 
Let's have a look at some de facto standards in different ecosystems. For example, in the, in the Java ecosystem, the de facto standard for parsing JSON is Jackson. And with Jackson, you start with, uh, with the type you would write anyway, the class person with the fields name and age. And then you add some annotations to the constructor that tell Jackson how to parse uh, this, uh, this type from JSON. And during runtime, the Jackson's object, object mapper leverages JVM reflections in order to read those annotations and to construct a parser grammar on the fly to, par to uh, parse a JSON, an unknown JSON structure into this domain object of type person. Similarly, in the Haskell universe, you usually use ASON in order to parse JSON. And there you, uh, you basically do it exactly the same way. You start with a type, the type you would write anyway, the record person with the field's name and age, and you add, you add a derived generic clause. This uh, derived generics is, uh, generic is from a GHC feature, uh, compiler feature called generics, and it basically adds some runtime type information to the types you declare. So during runtime, the uh, ASON's parse JSON function can use and leverage this type information in order to generate a parser grammar on the fly to, um, to parse an unknown JSON object into a person object. Now, how does it look in the TypeScript universe? Unlike other ecosystems, there doesn't seem to be a consensus yet on what is the standard JSON parsing framework for TypeScript. And when I started out on a TypeScript project, I was kind of surprised how bad TypeScript is at handling JSON. With years as a professional Java and Scala developer and as a Haskell enthusiast, I had certain expectations for modern JSON parsing, but as it turns out, TypeScript is mostly still stuck in the JavaScript age. And in order to see what I mean by being stuck in the JavaScript age, let's first have a look at how JSON parsing works in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you usually uh, use the json.parse function. It's a built-in, built into the language, and that converts a JSON string into a JavaScript object. Now in JavaScript, you don't have any types for objects. You only have the object type, but you can't get any more specific than that. So um, why even bother about parsing a, a JSON string to anything more specific than a JavaScript object, which is basically a plain JSON abstract syntax tree? Now, the problem with this approach of using json.parse and then um, then throwing some validations at the result is that if you look at client code, we have to assume that uh, those checks were performed. For example, that person.age exists. So we have to assume that we have checked it before. These two snippets may be in totally different files in different locations in your, uh, in your source code repository. So if someone removes the check for existence in the first file, we wouldn't notice that in the second file. And also, um, those checks for key existence don't really add that much value. As we get errors when, existing, when, when accessing non-existing properties anyway, so it's tempting to skip those checks altogether since we get error messages anyway. And also, did you notice the missing type checks? We should be checking that name is a string and age is a number, but we didn't. We forgot that. So we, we still will run into, uh, into type errors during runtime, although uh, we were assuming that everything should be all right and should be fine and should have been checked before. Now, in the TypeScript world, this could look a lot different. In the TypeScript world, you actually do have object types. So that's good for once, and you could leverage them. However, 
in the TypeScript world, the, there's also still um, uh, still a lot of people use json.parse in order to parse uh, json and then just assign it the person type. And we do the same checks again. Now, of course, why, why are we doing this? The, uh, we're doing the same validation logic by foot anyway. Why don't we use types for that? And what's even worse, we are now actively lying about the types. You see, I still forgot the check for, for the field types, but now I'm telling the compiler to treat H as a number. So a consumer now has every reason to believe that uh, person.h exists. But in fact, uh, since I've, I, have, uh, I forgot to check it, in fact, I'm just actively lying about the types. And by the way, this example is not, uh, is not really contrived. If you search for how to parse JSON and TypeScript on Stack Overflow, uh, the top voted answer is by a large margin is still along, uh, along these lines of using JSON.parse and then throwing some, some checks at it. And it took four years uh, until another answer appeared uh, that actually covers the, uh, uh, the issues of type safety um, for JSON parsing and TypeScript, but it still doesn't have nearly the, the upvotes that the other answer has. So the question is, how can we do, uh, how can we do better? Um, because of course we could uh, just remove the, the person type annotation and replace it by the actual best known type we have and that is unknown. But, <clears throat> but that would just bring us back to the, to the JavaScript world. So the question is how can we do better? And one possibility to do better in uh, TypeScript is IOTS. And IOTS bridges the gap between uh, the JSON syntax tree and the actual domain structure. So it allows full two-step JSON parsing in TypeScript. In IOTS, we start with writing down the parser, parse, person C, in a declarative way. Then we ask IOTS to derive the type person from the parser. At runtime, we use the decode method of the parser to, uh, to convert the result, the JSON syntax tree uh, to the person type and to check whether the parsing was successful. Now, a consumer of, uh, a consumer of that can, does not only need to believe that they really know that person.h exists and is a number because we made sure that person C, the parser, and person, the type, are in sync and that all valid instances of person that were generated with this parser are actually um, were actually checked and validated. Let's have a more in-depth look. In many ways, IOTS behaves like one of those JSON parsers we saw before. It's declarative and it keeps types and parser grammars in sync. But in other ways, IOTS is very different from the typical parsers we have seen before. Um, mostly because of some unique features of the TypeScript type system. So usually, or typically, you start from the types and then invoke some kind of compiler or runtime reflection features in order to extract type information and turn the type information into a parser grammar. IOTS does it the other way around. You start with a parser and then you leverage the TypeScript type system uh, and derive the data type from the parser. This type, in, this, this type information is gone at runtime, but the parser will ensure that the result is still valid and has the right type. And at compile time, the type checker can use the derived type to make sure that uh, everything is compatible. This is due to the fact that with TypeScript, you have full type erasure, so you don't have any type information at runtime. And you have to do all the everything that is related to types during compile time, and that's why IOTS uses this rather unexpected approach and starts with a parser. Let's have a look at the parser structure. So um, 
you instead of starting with a type declaration, you start with a parser declaration that looks almost exactly the same, except that you have a T dot in front of everything. So you have the, instead of having the interface structure with the fields name and age, you have a T dot type with that structure. Then you have the fields, instead of the fields name and age with uh, their type declarations, you have uh, fields name and age with um, a T dot string and a T dot number. The C in person C uh, is for codec. So uh, rather than calling it parser, IOTS usually speaks of codecs because uh, IOTS allows both uh, allows conversion in both directions. So it allows parsing from a unknown structure and translating back to a structure. Note that we didn't add any type hint to the person codec. And that is what that is our next step, deriving the types. Um, so we use this double type of trick. The inner type of is the type of the person codec. And basically that that has the same structure again as the person type we would have declared before, just that, that we add a, a C to every type. So we have codec types here. And then we use the type of um, the, the type of function from IOTS in order to convert a, a codec type into a uh, into the actual domain type. And we can use this domain type in order to uh, or th this domain type is then used when parsing to uh, to type the result. So we can use the um, we use json.parse in order to parse our JSON string and then person c.decode in order to convert the JSON syntax tree into the actual person object. In case we fail, uh, the validation type is left and we can throw an error. In case the uh, we have a right result, a valid result, we can just return that. Now, of course, these examples were very, very trivial, um, but IOTS is actually pretty extensible. IOTS comes batteries included with basic codecs for primitive types, array types, composite types. So for most well-behaved JSON APIs, this should be already sufficient. But of course, you might run into situations where you need to create more complex parsers. Uh, first of all, there's a small extension library called IOTS types for more complex data types like date times, reg regular expressions, UUIDs, etc. Then you can combine parsers using the union combinator, intersection combinator. You can have partial objects, etc. And if you really need more, there's also more levels of ex extensibility. For example, branded types. Uh, branded types allow you allow you to refine uh, existing parsers into more specific parsers, like refining a number into a positive number. Then you also can uh, you, you also can use pipes for composing uh, parsers, like um, composing a parser that parses a number from a string with a parser that parses only positive numbers. So in the end, you have a, you end up with a parser that parses strings to positive numbers. And finally, you also can write your own codec from scratch. Let's have a look at the last one, writing your own codec from scratch, because I think it's very instructive and shows how IOTS works internally. So in order to write your own codec from scratch, you basically need four ingredients. First ingredient is a name. Uh, the name is mostly for error reporting, so you get nice and clean error messages. The second one is a type guard that is for checking that some object is a valid parser result, a valid domain object. The third one is a validator or decoder that uh, takes an unknown structure and parses it and validates it and uh, converts it to a known domain object. 
and the 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 last ingredient the encode function uh, takes a domain object and converts it back to a raw value now this is how this might look in reality so this example is actually taken from real life and suppose you encounter a rather ill-behaved API that decides to return either an array or a single value in some place, depending on how many elements there are. In that case, the well-behaved values would be arrays, but the codec would support parsing not only an array, but also a single value. So you can see the four ingredients here. First ingredient is our name and the name is just composed from array or single element of and then whatever name the uh, element codec has. The type guard is also just composed and uh, checks that all the elements are, that, that we have an array and all the elements are valid uh, instances of the element codec. Then the validate function Takes the, takes the input and first tries to parse it as an array. If that succeeds, all is well. But if it doesn't succeed, then we try again and try to parse it as a single value and map that single value to an, to an array. And last, uh, the encode function just converts the array back to a raw array element-wise. Now, IOTS doesn't entirely come without trade-offs. And one trade-off I find in particular is FPTS. FPTS is a pretty opinionated functional programming fr uh, framework for TypeScript, and it is a peer dependency of IOTS. So in order to properly use IOTS, you will have to buy into FPTS as well, at least to some degree. Here's an example. Uh, if we were to properly use IOTS, the parsing code would rather look like this. We would uh, take the result from person C and pipe it into a fold and handle the two cases left and right, uh, errors and result in, uh, in a fold. So this is very much based on functional programming, functional languages like Haskell. And I think this might be a problem for teams uh, that don't have a strong functional programming background. So, Although I like the idea of FPTS, I think the concept of parse don't validate uh, is much more uh, ubiquitous and should not be forcing you into using a rather opinionated functional programming framework. Uh, but there are alternatives out there. Uh, in particular, there are other players in the, in the market that use very similar concepts to, uh, to IOTS, like Zod and Runtypes. They don't have the popularity of IOTS yet, but they might be worth a look if you're hesitant to buy into FPTS. And also there are frameworks like Class Validator and Class Transformer that play in the same field, but use completely the completely different approach of decorators. Now, we're coming to, to the end of this talk. And uh, before we close, I would like to discuss one more thing, and that is openness versus closeness. I often read statements along the lines of um, strong type systems force you to categorize the world. They are, in, uh, they are inherently closed and they, uh, um, they don't allow you to, uh, to have uh, unknown structures. You, you're not, you, you wouldn't be able to deal with uh, unknown or partly known structures. And in fact, this is really not the case. On the contrary, um, with strong type systems and parsers, you can encode exactly the amount of type safety that you are willing to guarantee and nothing less, but also nothing more. Take, for example, a parser that parses HTTP requests. So uh, in this case, there are some fields we would like to inspect, like the method, the path, some headers, um, but there are also some, uh, some fields we don't really care about, for example, the payload or other headers, uh, except for authorization and host. So, uh, for example, if we were writing a proxy or a router, then we wouldn't care about the payload, 
that would be just a black box. And uh, but we would care about uh, some headers and the path and method. So in that case, the type exactly specifies what we did check. That would be the method, some of the headers, and what we didn't check, namely mostly the payload and the other headers. So in fact, <clears throat> this approach is strictly better than the open world of JavaScript. In JavaScript, the entire request would be basically unknown and there would be no way of discriminating between properties, the properties that we did validate and unknown properties that we treat as a black box. So now as a summary, I would like to give you uh, two, um, two takeaways uh, from, from this talk. The first one is parse, don't validate. Parsers add domain structure right at the boundary and the types help you documenting the assumptions and invariants that your parser guarantees. And secondly, put types to good use. It's best to leverage the type system in order to keep parsers and types consistent, plus uh, using types and generating parsers from types save you the effort of writing at least the trivial validations because uh, a parser library can just infer that from the um, can just infer that from uh, from the types. Now, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for listening and for joining. Um, I think we have about 10 to 15 minutes left for questions. So yeah, ask away and thank you very much for joining.